Thank you for those of you that knew about my quick trip to Indiana. I left uh, Thursday morning early and came back last night at 1 in the morning. I received a uh, text from my brother Mark saying that my mom had been admitted in the hospital on Wednesday and her CO2 levels were really low. And uh, so I decided, huh, or high, excuse me, really high. We wanted to be low, but they were high. And so anyway, uh, she was not very responsive. And, uh, she is being dismissed today to go back to the nursing home. She's 87 years old. She's been saying since the time I was in middle school, she is ready to die and go home and be with Jesus. And for someone that is so ready to die and go home and be with Jesus, because I'm 52 years old, so we're talking for about 38, 39 years she's been saying that. For somebody so ready to go home and be, and be with Jesus, she fights so hard to live. In fact, she said in the hospital you know, that she was a tough old lady. And I'm like, yes, she is a tough old lady. She was tough on us growing up as well. So, because I got the bulk of all the spankings because, you know, I was the youngest one and uh, I was afraid to tattle on my older brothers. And so when they got in trouble, and it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. I was the one they blamed and I'm the one that got in trouble. So, yeah, you all feel sorry for me right now. <laughs> Anyway, uh, it, it, my cousin Karen, from who is 69 years old, came up from Florida, so uh, she had planned to come up in September, but she wanted to see my mom because, uh, as I told Ray Oiler when his mom uh, was in the hospital last week, uh, I said, you know, every, you know, at this point in time, when you hit the late 80s, uh, you never know. So I decided to make that quick trip up there to make sure she knew that I loved her and I, I cared for her. And then I also gave my brother Mark a little bit of a break because he had a funeral and a, mar a wedding. And so it helped him not to feel guilty for being at the hospital and running all that, or not being at the hospital. He knew that I was there and my cousin was there. So thank you for your prayers. I made it back safely um, last night at about 1 o'clock in the morning. So, and then at 5.30 the cat was jumping on me ready to, for me to feed him. So... <laughs> Anybody that's not here this morning because they got to bed late or something like that, you can say, well, Pastor Myron, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've got a great heritage. Uh, my family lived on the same piece of property for mid for like a hundred and some years uh, before they finally sold it. And my grandparents bought a piece of property not too far, a small 40-acre farm. And as I uh, grew up uh, just down the road from there, when my mom, being a single mom taking care of four boys, life would get pretty challenging. She would work two and three jobs, and so my grandmother stepped in. Uh, my cousin was telling me that she uh, came back from Florida. They didn't want her to leave Florida. They had a place down there, but she came back to Florida, and they sold the place so that she could uh, be here to help take care of us boys or be in Indiana. And so when I would get off at, uh, the bus, I would get off the bus at her house down the street. And I remember being about in fifth grade that I got off the bus and I walked into the house and I was like, Grandma, 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 and she was not in the house. So then I went out to the barn. Grandma, maybe she was gathering eggs or something like that. I looked around the barn, she wasn't there and I began to freak out. I remember standing outside the barn freaking out because I thought Jesus Christ had come and I'd been left behind. <laughs> when we were in fifth or sixth grade, that's pretty traumatic. You know, I, and, and I have found out for those of us in the Protestant, raised Protestant, and, and all those things that were ingrained in you that Jesus Christ is going to return again, there's going to be a rapture, and then there's going to be seven years of tribulation. All that was going through my mind, and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to be going through tribulation, I'm going to have my head cut off, and it's going to be horrible, because the, back in that day and age, there were these movies called A Distant Thunder, An Image of the Beast, and it, it showed uh, the rapture happening, and Christians being, or people that had thought they were Christians being left behind and having their heads cut off because they didn't take the mark of the beast you know, that 666 on the hand or the forehead and all that. And I was really afraid. And so I, I, this morning's message, Don't Fear the Reaper, is dealing with fear of eschatology. Eschatology is a really big word that means end time things. Protestants believe in it, Catholics believe in it, Christians believe that one day this world is going to end. And there have been a lot of discussions about it. 
And we've been talking about Jesus Christ is going to return for dozens of years, hundreds of years. And in fact, the early disciples, the first, the disciples actually thought that Jesus Christ would return while they were still alive. And here we are 2,000 years later. People have written books about it, they've prophesied about it, uh, and those individuals are kind of now labeled as uh, heretics and, and you don't want to have much to do with them. Uh, I remember in 1988, I received a book in the mail, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Christ Was Going to Return uh, in, in 1988. The author of that book was wrong, and Jesus Christ didn't return in 1988, and so he rewrote a book and said, oh, my calculations were wrong, and he wrote a book, 89 Reasons Why Jesus Christ Would Return in 1989, and Jesus Christ never returned. Then he wrote a book, uh, 90 Reasons, uh, why Jesus Christ would come in 1990 because he got some calculations wrong again and I don't think anybody bought the book. 1992, I have a, a, about a three-quarter page uh, ad from the USA Today that, uh, paper uh, that said that Jesus Christ was going to return in the Feast of Trumpets uh, October 31st, 1992. Jesus didn't return in 1992 on October 31st. Y2K, some of you that are older enough remember Y2K and how all the computers were going to shut down around the world and Jesus Christ was going to return and, and it, you needed to have like two to three weeks at least uh, of supplies like water and food and Jesus Christ was going to return and he didn't return. This last year, the blood moons or this past you know, year, there was going to be blood moons and Jesus Christ was going to return. He didn't return. It's been that way over and over and over again through church history. People have tried to say that Jesus Christ was going to return and they started whole denominations over it. Fortunately, John Wesley didn't predict the day. Uh, the latest thing is September 23rd of this year. There, there, there's the, the planets are going to align. And if you watch the YouTube videos, it's the first time that it's happened in like 2,000 years. And so Jesus Christ is going to come. It's the Virgin and Leo and all these other planets. And there's like 10 planets that are going to be lined up. And it's going to be a catastrophe and Jesus Christ is going to return. Don't tell me that, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can pretty much guarantee you this. That Jesus Christ will most likely not return on September 23rd. 22nd? Yeah, he may come on the 22nd. He may come on the 24th. He may come on July the 24th or July the 23rd. But I, I would almost guarantee myself that he's not going to come September 23rd. That doesn't give you a right to go out and do whatever you want on that day. Because the Bible is very clear that no man knows the day or the hour, not even the Son of God, Jesus Christ, when He's going to return again. Again, Only God Himself knows when that day will come. And that day, and then He will say, alright Jesus, go. This morning the scripture text is found in Revelations chapter 20, and it's talking about the millennium, the thousand year reign of, of Jesus Christ. And in Revelations chapter 20, beginning with verse 1, it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked, so Satan could not be deceived, or could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. Afterward, he must be released for a little while. Verse 4, Then I saw the thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Come on. Mm -hmm. and, and that did happen in the early church, and it still happens today in countries around the world. It's not something old. For their testimony about Jesus and for the proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or a statue, nor accepted his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until a thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him for a thousand years. Now a thousand years is a, is a big term. Uh, and there's a lot of arguments over that thousand 
year reign of Jesus Christ here on earth in the millennium. In fact, there are, there are several theological arguments about it. There's the amillennialist view, there's the premillennialist view, there's the postmillennialist view. Those are the three major ones, but the postmillennial, not too many really espouse that. It's the premillennialist and the amillennialist that most Christians uh, espouse and say, we believe in one of those. And so, real quick, before I get to the points of the message this morning, uh, you're going to get a little bit of theology this morning. And, and so hopefully your brains don't explode and you don't walk out of here uh, just overwhelmed because it's going to be really brief and really quick. But you, we have the, there's four viewpoints up there, but we're going to ignore the first one for a little bit uh, and focus on the amillennialist view. The amillennialist view is the view that the, this thousand year reign of Jesus Christ is figurative and that uh, basically everything in the book of Revelation and the prophecies, a lot of that was fulfilled in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed and that we're always in tribulation. Come on, I talk about people being beheaded in Sudan. There, there are uh, parents that have to sit there and watch their, their daughters and their children being mutilated and stuff because of their faith and then the parents are killed. That's persecution. That's horrible. We're in tribulation. And one day, Jesus Christ is going to return, and then there will be the judgment, and we'll spend eternity in heaven. That's one viewpoint. Uh, that's been the viewpoint, uh, the predominant viewpoint of uh, some Protestants in the Catholic Church since uh, about 300 AD. Uh, before then, uh, it was a little minor, but they really espoused it in 300 AD. And then you have uh, the post-millennial view, which I won't take much time on, but they, that basically says that the thousand-year reign is not literal, it's a figurative lit, a reign, but instead of uh, always facing persecution, uh, basically uh, Jesus Christ will come again once we, the church, have done our job in uh, reaching everybody with the hope of Jesus Christ, and then... Uh, uh, then the church will have a great reign over all the earth. We will be the bosses, and then Jesus Christ will return. As I said, not very many people kind of espouse this view. Uh, but then you have the premillennialist view. The premillennialist view uh, believes that uh, right now here, Christ died and rose again, and then began the church age. And that one day Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to rapture the church out. Uh, and after that, there will be seven years of tribu tribulation. And then, then Satan's going to get locked up like the, we just read in the scripture. And there will be a thousand year reign of Christ. And then after that, there will be the judgment and the new heaven and the new earth. Now you have theologians. Oh, this, this, with, this view, the premillennial yeah, pre view was held by just a handful of early church fathers prior to 300 AD. Not very many. Tertullian was one. Origen was another. But not very many people espoused that view. Uh, but there were a few that did hold it. But in 300 it kind of went by the wayside with not too many people really believing in it. I think Polycarp actually did as well. Uh, but then it came back into popularity in the early 1900s when Schofield printed his Bible, and he espoused that view, and made it popular, and so you have a lot of evangelical Protestants that uh, believe this viewpoint, and we have the Left Behind series that has been written with uh, like a dozen books, I think, that are like really thick textbooks, but filled with a lot of stuff, and you can learn a lot of things about it. It's fiction, but based on the scripture, so it's uh, really kind of interesting to read. And uh, so churches believe that, but, or a lot of evangelical churches have espoused that and believe that, but there's arguments among about this, this issue because, uh, as they argue, some people believe no, Jesus Christ isn't going to come before the tribulation, he's going to come in the middle of the tribulation. And then there's other people that say, you know, well, no, um, Jesus Christ will come at the end of the tribulation. And you have people, the amillennialists and the premillennialists, that will argue for hours and hours about when Jesus Christ is going to come again. And they all have scripture basis and they can be very persuasive in what they're talking about uh, on these views. Now I tend to lean towards one of these, but I'm not going to...
going to share this morning because it's not about what I believe, uh, other than the fact that I will say there's another view, and I tend to be a pan millennialist. And some of you have to be old enough to remember panning for gold. Uh, it'll all pan out in the end. Uh, some of you young people have no clue what that is. Um, but I tend to be a pan millennialist that it will all pan out in the end. Um, and so to get caught up into arguing about it, we get we lose sight of what Christ has placed us here on earth to do. Amen. And this morning, I am going to share three things that we need to do. But in my research and study, one of the things I came across was David Robertson, who is a writer from Europe, and he was writing about the September 23rd date. And he wrote, I don't care too much about the millennial views. I don't know when Jesus is returning. I just know that he is. And by the way, his return is closer now than when you walk through those doors. It may be that he chooses to come in the rapture. It may be that he chooses to come and boom, period, that's it. And we face the judgment and we spend an eternity in heaven. Or it may be that we die. But we're going to be facing Jesus much sooner now than when you walk through the doors. He said, I know that the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. What a difference it would make to each one of us if we woke up in the, in the morning and just simply prayed, Lord, what open doors have you set before me today? What open doors have you set before me today? Then instead of banging our heads uh, against a brick wall or curling up in despair, we would walk through, the good, through those good news doors. Wow. I agree with him that we, we need to be looking at what Christ has called us to do and be going and loving and reaching out to the world. We need to be relentlessly pursuing God and the people He loves. So what are we to do? Number one, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42 through 44, we find what we're supposed to do. So you too must keep watch. For you don't know what day the Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch with a rifle or shotgun or something and not permit his house to be broken into. Okay, I didn't say that. I, 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 my paraphrase. It was, it, it was in the small print between. I didn't add. Um, keep watch. We have to keep watch. And that means that we don't just say, well, you know what? Jesus Christ is going to return someday, so it really doesn't matter what I believe. We, we need to keep watch. We need to see what's going on. We need to read the scripture, study the, the Bible, and know what it's talking about so that we can be aware of the things that are happening all around because scripture is being fulfilled. Every day, scripture is being fulfilled. And one day, Jesus is going to come again, and we need to keep watch. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. That be on guard means keep watch. Be looking. There's a story in Matthew uh, 20, 24 that talks about the, these virgins that were waiting for the bridegroom to come. Five virgins had plenty of oil and some, or some of the, the virgins had plenty of oil and were prepared and were ready and waiting for him and some didn't. And when, when the bridegroom came, uh, the celebration began, they shut the door, and the women that didn't, uh, the virgins that didn't have the oil and weren't prepared, they were shut out. And he's gonna, he, uh, Jesus said, that's going to be the same way when the Son of Man returns. Some people are going to be ready, and some aren't. There will be two people that will be working in a field, one will be taken, another left. Two people will be sleeping in bed, one will be taken, the other left. There will probably even be people that will be sitting in church, some will be taken and some will be left. And we need to be ready. Or be, we need to be watching and know what's going on around us. Now it goes on to say in verse 44, You also must be ready all of the time. For the Son of Man will come when least expected. All the time we need to be ready. One day, one day we are going to stand before God. We are going to stand before God and we will have to give account for everything that we do. In Philippians 2.10 it says, and also Romans 14, 10, 11, it says, As surely as, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Every
every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. And when we do, we'll be having to give account. Matthew says that we will give account for every idle word that is spoken. Every idle word that is spoken. You know, the people that are using the F word like it's going out of style, the people that are just being really critical all the time, not encouraging others, not sharing the love of Christ with the world, but being very judgmental. Every idle word is spoken. Our actions. God knows before Santa Claus, you know, he knows when you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you, if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness. You know, before Santa Claus, God's the one that knew. There's not, the Psalms 139 says, there's not a place where you can flee his presence. You can go to the deepest, darkest depths of the earth, and he is there. You can go to the highest heights, and he is there. You can close the doors and go to your closet and be all alone, and nobody else may know what you're doing, but God knows. God knows what you're doing. And we're going to have to give an account someday for all of that. I, I find that way too often those who profess to be Christians that have asked Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins and are pursuing that faith journey with, with Him, they, they try to see how close to sin they can get. You know, the world's over here having fun because the Bible does say sin is fun for a season. It does say it's fun. But after that, the judgment. So we try to see how close to sin we can get. We may even step over just a little bit. Uh, but then we claim grace. Oh, God, you know, by your grace you've been saved. Not on ourselves. It's a gift of your gift. So I can't boast about anything I've done. It's your gift. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your uh, that I'm going to be able to go to heaven. And we play around with sin. And what we need to do, instead of seeing how close to sin we can get, I've said it dozens and dozens of times, we need to see how close to God we can get. We need to be ready. In our thoughts, in our actions, in our attitudes, what we say, what we do, we need to be ready for when Jesus Christ returns again, however He may come. Whether it's us breathing our last breath, or Him returning with the sound of the trumpet, we need to be ready. Luke chapter 12 verse 48 says, For to whom much is given, much is required. My mom grained this into our minds over and over again. And, and I believe you're sitting here this morning. You know. You're aware. You've been in church. We in America, we have great blessings. And we've been in church. To whom much is given, much is required. God is going to hold us re responsible for what we're doing with what has been given to us. The knowledge that has been given to us in His Word. He'll hold us responsible and accountable. So we need to be ready. And then number three, not only do we need to watch, not only do we need to be ready, we need to encourage each other. Wait, that didn't say anything about that in Matthew 24. No, but in Ephesians, or 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, it says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, first for the believers who have died, will rise from their graves, then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be one, or we will be with the Lord forever. That's going to be an incredible day. That's going to be an incredible day because that's the day that we should be looking for. That's the day my mom is longing for. Uh, when my mom was young, or when I was young, and my mom was looking and had an article that talked about when Jesus Christ was going to return and some of the things, and she had the little, it had an article that I read, and it had the barcodes that we see on all the packages that we buy and uh, things now, and it had the three little lines. Maybe you've never really noticed it, but there's some one on either side and one in the middle, and the article was saying that was the six six six, and then it talked about implanting chips. Uh, in us that you know, we couldn't buy ourselves with all the without the chips, and I was like, "Wow!" You know, then I thought, "This is a bunch of hooey." And now everything we buy, zoom, zoom, and how do we do it? Our debit cards, and just this past week, we installed a chip in our dog, so if he ever gets lost, we know where he is. My goodness! Wow, that's pretty scary to start thinking about all that. But we don't have to be afraid because. When Jesus Christ returns, if we're prepared and we're ready, we get to go on to the celebration where it's going to be pretty incredible. I had somebody say, you know what, I don't know, I, heaven just sounds kind of, kind of boring. 
you know, just sitting up there uh, playing harps and, and sitting on clouds. You know, I don't see anywhere in the scripture where, number one, it's not biblical that we become angels when we die. That's not in the Bible. So when, you, when you, somebody dies and you say, oh, heaven's gained another angel, you know, they might have been a good person, but they don't become an angel. Uh, that we, angels are different than us. And then number two, it's not biblical that we sit around on clouds playing harps. That does sound good. Jonah would probably enjoy it if it was a guitar playing all day, but I just don't see playing a harp all day. That doesn't sound appealing to me a whole lot. Maybe for, maybe for you, uh, but I take it it's going to be the greatest party that has ever taken place that will never grow dull, uh, it will never be boring, it will not wake up with any hangovers, it won't end, and it will continue on and on and on. It's like the old song, when, when we... When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. What a day of rejoicing it will be. That's going to be an incredible day. And so Paul goes on in 1 Thessalonians and says in verse 18, So encourage each other with these words. Encourage each other with these words. Jesus Christ is going to come again. You're going through a financial hardship. You know what? Hang on. Keep pressing on. Don't give up because Jesus Christ is going to return at some point in time. You're, you're, you're facing all sorts of uh, persecution. Hang on. Jesus Christ is going to come. You're discouraged with life. Hang on. Keep fighting through because Jesus Christ is going to come again. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. And as Pastor Darren shared last week about the shortness of life on that big timeline, forever is a long, long time. And that's where we'll spend eternity. We need to encourage each other that this life isn't going to last forever. Eternity does. And when we see Jesus, when we get to heaven, it will be an incredible day of rejoicing. Amen? Amen. Ken Ham, who uh, was writing about the September 23rd event, he wrote, People who get excited about supposed signs miss the point that Jesus made in Matthew 24, uh, Instead of setting dates, we ought to be ready for his return at any moment. Are you ready? So I gave you a quick theological argument or discussion and lecture on the different millennial views. But all that boils down to basically, are you ready? Are you ready to see Jesus Christ for him to come again? You know, we get so caught up in this world, this is where it's at. And the older we get, we find out, you know what? Life goes by really, really quick. Amen. Really quick. It seemed like just not that long ago that I was getting off that school bus and looking for my grandma, sitting in the chair while she'd peel apples and slice them up for me to eat, watching Bob Braun on the 500 Club. Uh, you know, some of you updating myself there. It seems like just the other day. And for my mom, it seems like just the other day that she was a little girl playing on the home, home place, running up in the pawpaw patch and swinging on the tire swing and going out and working in the farm. It seems like just the other day. You know what? Life goes by quickly. And all the things that we are pursuing in this life, they're going to pass away. What remains is what we pursue for eternity. Let's pursue Jesus Christ. Let's relentlessly pursue God and the people that He loves. And I can guarantee you this. If you share the hope of Jesus Christ with a neighbor, with a co-worker, with a classmate, and when we stand before God, and they stand before God, they're going to look over and they're going to say, Hey, thanks, Jonah. I appreciate you sharing, man, because I, I would have been messed up without it. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Mason. Boom, boom, boom. They're going to be saying thank you because of the hope that you have shared with them. May we share the hope of Jesus Christ. May we watch. May we be ready. And may we encourage one another. And all the more as we see the day approaching. Let's be prepared. Praise team is going to come. And as they come, we're going to pray. And, and you know what? All of us, even those on the praise team, myself, 
If we were to be honest and transparent with the person that we see in the mirror, we could say, you know what? There are things I've been obsessing about in this life. Maybe you're obsessing about Jesus Christ's second coming and you've been so focused on those things, you could, you, you're could, you one that could put all the charts all, all the way around this building and share it. You know it in and out, but you're failing to, to reach out with the hope of Jesus to the people around. Maybe you're pursuing the stuff of this world. You want more and more and more and more. And I tell you this, stuff will not satisfy you. The relationships in this world, I've seen people go from one after another. My brother was married five times and lived with two different women before he finally settled down and realized, you know what, a woman's not going to satisfy. It's what God will do in my life. It's what God will do and surrender to him. My brother was in heaven. Thankfully, he finished right. May we all finish right. And I'm so thankful that I had that opportunity to go to my brother's apartment and look through stuff and find uh, in the last three months of his life where he had finished right, right. He'd written journals, written prayers, and praying for different ones, and he finished right. And I know that as he stood before God, in spite of all the things that he had done in the past, God was able to say, come on into the place that I've prepared for you. Because he had sought forgiveness. May we look in the mirror. May we be transparent with ourselves and say, God, forgive me. May I pursue you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength in you alone. Challenging message this morning. And if you're here, you know, you know what? I believe the greatest days are still ahead for this church. I believe there are lots of people out there that need to hear about the hope of Jesus Christ. They need a relationship with Him. They need to begin the faith journey. There are some that have been part of us that have, have stopped. But there are many, many more out there who have never been part of us that can start. Let's reach out to them with the hope of Jesus Christ. Let's say, God, forgive me of my sins. Help me to be ready. Help me to watch. And help me to encourage others for the day you return again. Would you stand with me? Father, thank you so much for this day. And as we stand before you in your presence right now, I ask that you would just speak to us. Help us to confess those areas in our life where we have made everything else a priority besides you. We have been pursuing the things of this world. We, we have been enjoying sin way too much rather than enjoying you and your presence. Forgive me. Thank you that our faith is not based on fiction, but on facts. And thank you that one of those facts are 